Okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome today to today's Consciousness Club. It's my pleasure to introduce Johannes Kleiner. He's a physicist and mathematician who works on mathematical topics in consciousness science. He did his PhD in maths and, and he finished it in 2017 at the University of Regensburg. And then he went to do a postdoc at the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Leibniz University. And then he saw the light in 2020 and decided to pursue a PhD in mathematical philosophy. I'm just kidding. So he has two PhDs. Uh, and now since 2023, he's been a postdoc at the Institute of for Psychology of the University of Bamberg, and also a visiting scholar at the NYU Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness. Uh, so I'm really excited for today's talk, and it's going to be, uh, what is the title again? Sorry. <laughs> it's going to be about theories of consciousness in a structural turn. Johannes, can you pull up your slides uh, so we can give a start? All right, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the introduction and for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor, really. And I said this before, and I just want to stress it again. For me, this is, I'm very glad to be able to share my thoughts, but this is really to understand your thoughts. So I want to know what you think about um, the things I say and the things that are happening in the field right now in these regards. So yeah, thank you. So I don't know how precisely the timing is going to work out. So I might have to skip a few slides at the end, but we'll just see. And please, at any time, if you feel that I'm um, being too quick, or if you have any questions of understanding in between, don't hesitate to slow me down. And yeah, otherwise, thanks again for being here. Okay, so I want to talk about theories of consciousness today. And I want to talk about theories of consciousness in something that could potentially be called a structural term. So, okay, let me just start with bringing everyone to the same page. We all work in consciousness science, I suppose, but we probably have different understandings of what theories or models are. So today I'm going to use the term theory of consciousness just as designating a substantial, hypothesis about how something in the sciences, like for example, neural science, uh, natural, so for example, the brain and neuroscience and conscious experience relate. This doesn't presuppose any dualism, there's just an epistemic distinction. And that's what I mean by theories of consciousness. And I'll use the term either conscious experience or phenomenal character to designate this bit here, which we're trying to link to. And I will also use the abbreviation TOC, TOC, um, in the slides, just because I have to print that term theory of consciousness like a hundred million times. So I thought like, let's just designate it like this. Okay. And so basically the starting point of my talk is that we have very many talks right now. Um, so here's a very wonderful list that my friend and colleague Jonathan Mason made um, in Oxford, from Oxford. And um, he stressed that this list is not complete. Some, some theories might be missing. Arguably, there's many things that have been published that count as theories that are not in the list. Um, some of them might refer to similar or analogous constructs. So this is just a very quick overview, but it's still 39 theories. So why do we have so many? And if you compare that with other sciences, even in their early development, there weren't so many usually. Um, and so what I want to talk about is, um, in, in the initially, is the reason for why I think that we have so many. And the reason I think is that the theories we're currently building don't actually address phenomenal character as a, as a whole, but they actually address very specific parts, if you like, or aspects of phenomenal character, like for example, whether a stimulus is perceived consciously or not. And they mainly do this um, by just having, fundamentally they have a binary classification. So they basically say, well, either you have perceived the stimulus consciously or not, or consciously or you haven't. Or um, maybe they say you either have consciousness at all or you don't. And so most contemporary theories on my view really target binary distinctions about consciousness. And this is the reason I think that we have so many. It's fundamentally, it's very easy to make theories that target binary distinctions. So you basically just pr pr pick any property mode mechanism or configuration in the brain and if that property mode mechanism or configuration is present, you just represent that as a one. If it's not present, you represent it as a zero. And then you can just go ahead and produce your theory of consciousness by saying that the stimulus quality or sub quality or subject is conscious in the one cases and it's unconscious in the zero cases. That is not to say that experiments are very difficult and hard to do. And there's a lot of absolutely important empirical data in the experiments and in the theories. But just when it comes to the actual theoretical work, it's like super easy. And that's, I think, at least the major reason we have so many theories. Um, I'm sure many of you get new theories in the mail daily. I once showed this list 
on the other slide to Dave Chalmers, and he found it funny because if I understood him correctly, on his view, 39 is just, the count is way too low. He gets new theories all, all the time. So, um, and here just a few examples of the things we do when we model theories. So for example, the binary distinctions we, um, we use might be being conscious versus not being conscious, perceiving a stimulus consciously, experiencing a particular quail, saying that some X is part of the phenomenal character or not. And this really comes from the experiments we do, which are very good, but the theories literally embody the experimental evidence in good cases. And formally then we just build sort of, as I said, binary distinctions into theories, maybe being conscious is represented as zero one or perceiving a stimulus. Or in some cases we formalize how conscious the system is, this level business, there's also a lot to be said, but we use real numbers. Um, and I should emphasize, we do much more complicated math when it comes to statistics, but in the actual theory formulation, there isn't so much. So the question is like, isn't that sufficient? Why don't we just do that? Well, like, here's a wonderful slide. I'm sorry, uh, slide is, I don't want to praise the slide, but a wonderful distinction that was mainly deduced by Andrew Lee in a recent paper, which is called Light in the Room, very much recommended to read. So he basically tries to move us towards using terms in sort of the same sort of way as we talk. And obviously we, we wouldn't be in science if I wouldn't disagree with at least one of the choices. So here's a slightly different one. But fundamentally, there's a distinction between, on the one hand, the phenomenal character, which is maybe just what it is like for X to Y, for a bat to fly around, um, which you could then separate out into a part that's subjective character. I wrote it up here if anyone wants to read it. Basically, the awareness of being aware or something similar, and then the rest of phenomenal character, which you could call qualitative character. And that has to be distinct from like the property that makes you have phenomenal character at all. Um, that's a term that Matthias Mikkel recommended, and I very much like, like it, the consciousness maker of sorts. And if you think in these terms, which I'm sure like this is a bit quick, but I'm just trying to use terminology, which I hope as time goes will be more common to some of the people. I'm sure it's like many of you know this already. You can think about what the theories we have right now actually target. And they basically either target qualities, which for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call... I'm going to use to designate properties of qualitative character. You could just as well use any other term, qualia, phenomenal properties or whatnot, whatever you like, but I'm going to use qualities. Or they target the consciousness maker directly. And they do not, on my, on my point of view at least, or most series do not target any of these. They do not target phenomenal character comprehensively or qualitative character or subjective character in most cases. I know there's a relation to higher order theory, thought theory, and we're going to come to that. Okay. So the question we have to ask is like, um, if we agree that these are part of the explanandum that we eventually, um, sorry, yeah, any one, one of those, that we eventually, part of the things that we eventually want to explain in the science of consciousness, we have to think about how we should actually target those, how we should model those, how we should include those into our theories. And the point is like, there's already a lot on that end. Um, we already use mathematical structures and mathematical spaces to represent conscious experience beyond the binary distinctions. However, other, for, other than three theories, we do not actually use them in the theory of consciousness right now. So here's a list I made, I think a year ago or so, um, where I just tried to have at least one publication from every research program that uses spaces. Um, I need to update the list, it's not very up to date, but the message is there's a lot. And this is for me the justification really for talking about a potential structural turn that's happening right now. For the purpose of that talk, I will just abbreviate these mathematical spaces or structures to describe or represent phenomenal character as phenomenal spaces. There are many other good terms like quality spaces, but let's just stick with one of them for now. Okay, so as I said, I think we can arguably think about whether there might be a structural turn happening where we move away from these binary distinctions towards these spatial representations of phenomenal character. Um, but if and one thing is clear, then at least for the majority of theories, they are so far left out. The challenge is really to build theories, theories of consciousness that make use of these spaces. So if we look at this picture again, the challenge is really to somehow bring the spaces into this side and use them to represent conscious experience. And as mentioned, we already have three theories that try to do that. So we have on the one hand, integrated information theory, which most of you probably heard of. Um, basically, it takes the formal description of a system as provided by some natural science and then provides a complex algorithm which, which formally is a mapping 
um, from the space of these configurations to a space of spaces. So you have these things that are called in 4.0 phi structures. They are supposed to represent normal query quality. The second theory or class of theory is higher order thought theories. They can be very naturally combined with quality spaces. So here's, for example, the only version I, I hopefully understand to some extent, which is the, um, the reality monitoring version, um, which basically says that you have a higher order thought, maybe in the prefrontal cortex, that, that means I see blue. And then blue is actually sort of a pointer to the part of the quality space down here that this term refers to. I'm sure that's wrong on so many levels, but just the intuition. Um, I mean, my explanation of that is wrong on so many levels. And then the final theory is theory that's not very well known. That's super interesting, though, on my point of view. From my point of view, that's expected float entropy theory that has been developed by Jonathan Mason. And these theories use spaces, but to some extent, they don't fully live up to the challenge so far. And the reason is that they all do not actually address phenomenal spaces that um, legitimately describe conscious experience or that are known to describe conscious experience for independent reasons. So in the case of integrated information theory and the expected float entropy theory, um, they just provide structure and they, this structure does not yet link to phenomenal spaces in any meaningful way. In the case of, uh, case of higher order thought theory, it's a little bit different. Uh, this version, at least, and I think at least one other version of higher order thought theory, they have something that you could call division of labor, where basically there's one story to be told about the consciousness maker. So the property that renders you um, sort of conscious, that makes you have a phenomenal character. And then there's a second story to be told about um, how the representation, say, they pick up, how it relates to phenomenal character. That's division of labor. It's also a term for Matthias Michel. And for that reason, they basically provide the infrastructure where, and Stephen, I think that's what he said just a second ago, where you can plug in your preferred phenomenal space or quality space. Okay, so in a sense, um, we do have theories, but out of the 39 or so theories, which arguably all embody some important thought or experiment, um, that's it. So my point, or the major point of that thought uh, talk is that these series will really have, we, sorry, if we manage to have structural theories, will really have um, an important theoretical impact. And what I want to show on this slide is that I think that structural theories of consciousness will have a larger explanatory scope and they will also be more predictive. So on the one hand, as said, the contemporary theories really, they're binary distinctions. And as I've tried to argue or at least indicate, um, that means they're comparably easy to make. Yeah, and they only address parts or aspects or properties of phenomenal character. Um, so what the structural approaches bring to the table is a new or better way of describing or representing or modeling phenomenal character. They can cope arguably with the richness of phenomenal character, but also with the apparent details of phenomenal experience. And they can in particular account for the structure in the phenomenal structure in qualities or qualia. And what that means is that if you manage to build these structural approaches into theories of consciousness, the theories address phenomenal character more holistically, if you like. They automatically get a larger scope. They're just better theories, and I would say much better theories. Um, they can do much more. So that's the first theoretical impact. And the second theoretical impact is that um, it comes from the fact that it's much more difficult to make a structural theory of consciousness. If you want to associate structure with normal character, you have theoretical constraints and mathematical constraints. We can go into the details in the discussion session that you have to satisfy. And that means they're harder to make, but that also means they're more predictive. So arguably, if we go full structural, we look at the science of consciousness where we have fewer theories that are more predictive and have a larger explanatory scope. That's the theoretical impact as far as theories are concerned, but I also do think there's also a large practical impact or real world consequence. And here's just one example. So for example, if you um, look at chronic pain, I hope um, nobody suffers from chronic pain, but statistically 10% of, of the population suffer from chronic pain at some point in their life. So this is arguably one of the state of the art models of chronic pain right now. It's based on predictive processing theory. Um, please let me know if you disagree. I'd, I'd, I'd love to learn more about um, models that I, maybe I'm not aware of. But this is the state-of-the-art predictive processing models. And what it does is literally models chronic pain by a single number, um, which is called set here. Yeah? 
And if you compare that with a structural approach where you can, a whole can have a whole space that might have various dimensions or might not even be a vector space that has dimensions, but something more complicated like this Calabi-Yau manifold here, well, there's just so much more you could do and so, so many more questions you could address, but also so many more constraints you could factor into getting the right theory. So here, um, just a few things I cooked up on how to maybe distinguish various dimensions of chronic pain. Um, so I think that if we go and make models that, that, are, that address not one single variable, but complex spaces, um, we arguably could have sort of much better grab on a theoretical um, basis or on the origin of things like chronic pain. Okay, so in other words, the challenge really is, if we look at these series, is really not only to make talks with spaces, but we somehow have to make talks with the right spaces, with spaces that somehow, um, you know, really correspond to phenomenal characters. So what I want to do in a few slides is really just quickly talk about the question um, about what is the right space. And by, and sort of, what I mean is really what is a space or structure of conscious experience? And much of my own research focuses on this question. So here are two, but here's one summary paper which touches on it a little bit. Here's a paper where we really try to answer that question fundamentally. And there's a new one just recently which ties that into structural debates uh, in philosophy of science in general. And we're actually gonna have a tutorial in ASIS, um, on this in the ACES C. And the goal of the tutorial is not to present someone's research individually, but we just invited a whole bunch of people, as many as we can cram into the two and a half hours or whatever. I think we're eight right now. And everyone just gets to, I think, maybe eight minutes to answer the question, what even is structure? What do you think that the term means? Okay. And by that question, really, like in my own research, in the tutorial, but also in a talk, what I really mean is not sort of what is the actual structure that we should plug into the theories. There are few results already on that end. But I mean, what does it mean to say that conscious experience has, say, a topological structure? Or what defines why conscious experience have a metric structure rather than a posit partially ordered set labeled graph? And my claim would be that only once this is clear can we actually start talking about the right structure. And I think that's the first step in sort of creating a thorough foundation for this structural term that we can all build on. So um, I don't want to bore you. I just want to give you what I think are the most important facts. So first of all, like technical terms like qualities and qualia and consciousness, they require definitions. I think everyone agrees. You know, if you, if you go start about qualia, you better have some vague idea of what you mean. And if they have problems, we come up with better definitions. And my, my main point here and that part is that so do mathematical terms. Um, we need to define what we mean when we say that you know, like a metric structure is a structure of conscious experience. And in the case of mathematical structure, these definitions are really methodologies, just because there's so much more to do to get us to get to a space. So one and the same phenomenal character, which is represented very abstractly here, you get different spaces if you presuppose different methodologies. And I would just like to stress it's not meaningful to talk about structure independently of such conventions. You have to choose a convention either implicitly or explicitly. Um, to make a meaningful statement, on my view, but please disagree uh, if you if you feel that's not true. Okay, and so here's one slide um, where I just wanted to run you through what, on my view, is like the most promising. Um, okay, I should say it's my own research, so the mo most promising, on my view, um, way to think about structure. So here's the definition. Don't worry too much about the definition itself, but fundamentally. Um, this methodology boils down to the following fact. So in any way of talking about structure, any of the proposals of quality spaces that are out there by, by Clark or Rosenthal or many others, we already always have a baseline correspondence between um, sets on the one hand of qualia. So sets is a mathematical object. Qualia or qualities or whatnot are part of the phenomenal character. So we, all, we already have this sort of, if you like, baseline correspondence. And what we usually do is then we do some magic to somehow work our way up to making structural claims. The magic might be very meaningful in terms of laboratory operations, or it might even be meaningful in terms of mathematical convenience. But as far as consciousness is concerned, usually the justification breaks down a little bit. If anyone's specifically interested, that's specifically what this Newton, yeah, this um, paper about the human problem, which I just had on the other slide, addresses. So here's uh, how I think we should really work when we when we talk about structures. So in my view, what we should do is we should basically say, well, um, we have, on the one hand, we have sort of mathematical structures and 
mathematical structures have something that's called the automorphism group. So it's these are variations of the structure that meaningfully preserve the structure. On the other hand, because of this baseline correspondence, we also have variations um, of conscious experiences that change around the conscious experience of normal character. You could any you could have any a higher order property here that changes around as you switch from one conscious experience to the other. So a good way to talk about like to define what it means to have some structure really is just to say, well, the variations on the math side, which are just the homomorphisms or automorphisms, and the variations on the conscious side, which determine whether a higher order phenomenal property changes or not, well, they should just be identical. Yeah, this is the idea. We say a mathematical structure is a phenomenal space if and only if there's a phenomenal property in the phenomenal character that behaves exactly as the mathematical structure does on the variation. So this is just a very quick sort of insight into how I think we need to think about these things if you want to uh, want to avoid, first of all, if we want to be rigorous, if we want to build onto previous proposals, and if we want to avoid these things that have to do with the Newman problem. Um, well, in simpler terms, um, if like basically it just means that somehow the variations of conscious experience like, are somehow supposed to be equivalent to the automorphisms for the right structure that describes um, mathematical that describes phenomenal character. So I know this was super quick and I apologize. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on that. Ask me again if you have questions. I also think that there are various other people working on that and I want to give them full credit and I hope in the tutorial we'll sort out what the best way to, is to think about this, but I couldn't resist at least sort of giving you a glimpse of, of how you could do this. So back to the main story. So we talked about theories of consciousness and how we need to build structural theories of consciousness. We have three theories that make the first step already, but we need to improve on this. So what I want to draw, address in this little part of the talk, I want to discuss how we would actually build structural theories of consciousness. And um, maybe a little disclaimer, it will not be very constructive. It will be more deconstructive. Um, so what I think we shouldn't do. So fundamentally, we'll have to do the same thing we do for binary theories of consciousness. Well, we have some story of the brain. We have some space here, and we want to express hypothesis about the two. The difference, as I'm sure you all agree, is that in the case of structural theories, unfortunately, we have to use formal tools. We have to use mathematics simply because spaces and structures are math to sort of combine these two things. So it doesn't matter which picture of the brain you have specifically on the left. You somehow want to make, want to understand, and also it doesn't matter which level of, of the brain you're discussing. We somehow want to understand how the level of you, the, the level of choice you're making relates to spaces that describe phenomenal character. And one thing that people tend to do always is they say, well, why don't we use isomorphisms? Isomorphisms are structure preserving mappings between these two domains. Why don't we use them? And it is true that isomorphisms are super fundamental in math and many other sciences, and they're super ubiquitous whenever you have structure. So it's not a bad idea. But unfortunately, like all the applications in science, are very disanalogous to the case of consciousness we have here. And so the, a message that I really care about to make sure that we don't just run into the wrong direction on my view right away when we start a structural turn really, is to emphasize that you can use an isomorphism, but you have to be aware that there's absolutely no justification of doing so. It's pure, it's your pure choice, you know, it's pure um, sort of subjective preference if you do. So for example, um, isomorphisms do not explain, predict, or control structural phenomenal properties of conscious experience, where this quote, except for the structural part, is from Anil Seth, the real problem of consciousness. So at the very least, we, want, we would want a structural theory of consciousness to do that. It should explain the structure of consciousness, or it should allow us to predict the structure of consciousness, or it should allow us to control um, the structure of consciousness. And isomorphisms don't do that because an isomorphism requires there to be fixed structures on both ends. It's structure preserving. Saying that you want an isomorphism means knowing the structure already, not explaining it. Um, so they presume the structure in both ends. And furthermore, also, they do not in any meaningful sense pick out structure among all possible phenomenal structures. Um, maybe as an analogy, if you think about sort of the analogous case in binary, in the binary phase of consciousness research really is the identity theory of the brain, the neural identity theory. If you think about identity theory, it's not a bad idea, you know. Um, you can go ahead and be an identity theorist. But all theories of consciousness right now are, or made, all major theories are functionalist theories of sorts, or at least not pure identity theories. 
And the identity theory was more like a historical precursor to many other theories that are around now. And I think it's the same thing for isomorphisms. Isomorphisms is the first thing you're going to bet on. And um, yeah, and that's good. You know, we need to bet on something, but we need to be aware that it's just a bet and there's no justification. Maybe as another analogy, which I think sometimes helps to understand this, well, if you think about computer games, you know, in computer games, we have some code and the code defines these wonderful, rich graphics we see in nowadays games. And there is no structural isomorphism between the code and the, the graphics. So in this sort of maybe like in this analogous situation where we code sort of visual scenes, we don't do so by isomorphisms. And that's why I think it's another reason or a good way to illustrate that you can't choose isomorphisms and think you're justifying doing. You can do it without justification. Okay. So I think here's a big X uh, just for everyone. And so details are in this paper if you're interested in detailed criticism. This is the structural term paper. Okay. So we can, so on my view, how do we do it then? Well, we have to build the theories one by one, just in the bind, just like in the binary phase. Uh, we have to build a theory, we have to have an idea and then think about how we define the math to build upon the series. There's no mathematical formalism that fits them all. We won't get that. It's going to be hard work to make theories. And um, we have to think about which math we use probably in every single case. And it is still possible to do this. And as an example, I wanted to show you another sort of theory, which you all know very well, that's GNW. And on the two slides, which luckily we still have time to do, I just want to present to you how you can turn GNW into a um, structural theories and you can do, literally can do it free of charge. You don't have to introduce any, almost I think, any um, new stuff, it's already all there. Um, the downside of that example is you just, you notch it up to the structural level, but only to the extent that IIT, higher order thought theory and expected float entropy theory are structural at this point. So you don't get an actual phenomenal space, you just get the exact time formal structure as in the case of IT. So let's look at IT real quick. So IT is this algorithm which provides a mathematical structure to account, to account for what we could call phenomenal character. They use different terms. Um, so here's the quote, the quality of the experience is identical to the phi structure, that's what's illustrated here, of distinctions and relations. As mentioned before, GNW does not account for how this actually relates to phenomenal character. That's Dave Chalmers' Rosetta Stone problem of IT. You just get a bunch of math and are supposed to make sense of it. Um, but what I'd like to show here is that you can easily extend GNW to get to the exact same number. And so here's the, here's the one slide that presents that. So we have to think about, I'll do that a bit quickly. So for those who are not so into formal stuff, or probably it's too quick for everyone, but I'll do it quickly anyway. Um, sorry about that. But fundamentally, if you think about IT's formal structure, well, you realize that there's a part of the structure that's really essential, then there's a lot of auxiliary structure. They just get to define that structure, which is essential. And the essential structure is they have a domain that's just a set. They call them phenomenal distinctions. In our case, we would just call them qualities. It's a terminological choice. You have a monoidal product on these distinctions. You have a norm-like function that for every element in the distinctions give you real numbers. And then you have lots and lots of relations of different rarity um, on these distinctions. And that's all the actual structure that IIT cares about. If you want to read up, so Tron and Tron Tull and I have two papers where we go into depth in what the structures in IIT 3.0. 3.x, 3.9, actually, like the latest paper you could find, which was not 4.0. So that's all the structure that literally is. And it gives rich a rise to these rich spaces just because there's so many phenomenal distinctions. If the system has n components, they're like the two to the n distinctions, roughly speaking. So it's just very, very rich, but the actual structure is very minimal. So how do we reproduce that for GNW? So here is a Stanislas de Hans slide from um, ACC to, from uh, two years ago at ACC. It's also in some publications. I'm presuming that you know what GNW is for now. And fundamentally, what Stan said in that talk, which I very much loved, is that he basically said, conscious access corresponds to the ignition of a subset of the workspace neurons distributed in prefrontal and other associative cortices, whose topology as a vector defines the conscious content. And what I'm going to show you now is exactly that. If you're from math, you're probably wondering topology and vector, that doesn't go together, but it does go together in modern math. There's something that you call topological vector spaces. So here's how we get the exact same structure as an IIT, just based on what's in this picture and this idea. So first we just talk about states of neuronal assemblies. We interpret every dot here, not as a neuron, but as a neuronal assembly. 
So it's basically a function from neurons in the assembly to real numbers. Every neuron gets a real number as a state simplification. And then we can define the exact same structure as above as follows. So there are certain spaces, they're called LP spaces, they're topological vector spaces, which are basically just vector spaces whose elements, so the vectors in the vector space are these functions. That's a little bit, you know, you have to run, you wrap your head around, I'm sure this is too quick to do that, but uh, maybe, you know, when you go to sleep tonight, you'll think about it again. And what you can do just sort of as an FY, you can basically say, well, the domain is just a set of all the LP spaces on the various nodes. They automatically have a product. You have an automatic and an, a monoidal product. It, you, you get it for free. That's just what this structure has. It already has a seminar. You get that for free. That's just what that structure has. And then the only work really you have to do once you made that choice is you have to say, well, how do you define the relations? Well, you can very easily, for example, define the relations via the connections, so the green lines between the neural assemblies. You can say, well, there's a relation between um, space one and space two if there's a connection. And I'm not saying this as a proposal that that's what GNW should do. It absolutely isn't. I'm just saying that this is a very easy way to sort of get the notch into the structural turn. And we can do that, I think, for a bunch of other theories. The difficult question is, how do we map this or a much better idea that replaces this idea to phenomenal spaces that we actually know? OK, so the message is, yes, we can do that. And oh, that was quick. So I already, so sorry, I probably I talked way too much, uh, too quickly. But that's all I wanted to say already. So let me just uh, give you a bunch of conclusions. So first of all, thanks very much for the attention. And I really want to know what you think. Um, and then here are the three points that I really wanted to make in this talk. So first of all, I think that the structural term will be amazing if we can all make it happen together. We'll get better theories, better tests of theories. But then also what I didn't talk about in this talk, we'll get better measures. We'll get better ways of measuring NCC. We'll get better philosophy. I think like we're just there, there's nothing I think that's going to be worse. Everything is just going to be much more harder, which is a good thing and, and sort of much more um, meaningful in a sense. The second major point that I wanted to make is that it's challenging to build structural theories of consciousness that address actual phenomenal spaces. And we have to build them, on my view, one by one. And what I really would be very glad about if we could avoid, on my view, this uh, sort of shortcut, this, um, how do you say this in English, like this very um, interesting looking shortcut of just going to ESOS. If we do that, we'll probably, on my view at least, we'll probably just waste a few dozen years to get out of that shortcut again. And the Gene W example was really just meant to show you that it is possible to build structural theories of consciousness. And then the final thing which I just had in these very few slides is that that really concerns my own research is that there's progress on the foundations. So what does it mean um, when you say that something is a mathematical structure and pertains to consciousness. And I think of this pro progress part as a very small part of a whole community effort, as we have seen with these many papers we had even two years ago. And I think there's important developments elsewhere. And yeah, and I'm just very grateful to be part of that. So that's all. Thanks very much. All right, let's all unmute and thank you, Johannes. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so for the discussion, we're going to use the raise hand function. Um, maybe see if you can stop the recording so we don't have to filter our questions. Uh <laughs>